Hello, today I wanted to take a look at the um, Victor Davis Hanson's book, The Second World Wars, Wars Plural. Uh, the Second World Wars, How the First Global Conflict Was Fought and Won. It's a very interesting book. came out last year, October 2017, I believe. A uh, very thought-provoking book, and um, I kind of just wanted to share my thoughts on it. Um, so, first of all, the, the basic theme of this book is that Germany and Japan were able to create these really, really effective regional military forces that were able to conquer their respective uh, geographic areas, Europe and for Germany and, and a big chunk of the Pacific for the Japanese. But neither one of them was able to create a truly global military force. And that, of course, was contrasted with the um, ability of the Allies to create these, these global forces, particularly the United States, to a lesser extent Britain. And, you know, the fact that they were able to wage such a war on such a scale was a very, um, you, you ultimately led to, to the Allied victory. Now, uh, there's some other themes in this book. Certainly, um, Hansen spends a lot of time really hitting the point that Germany and Japan, their war primarily could be characterized as um, in fact, the whole World War uh, II could be characterized essentially as Germany and Japan massacring unarmed civilians. That the vast death toll from that war was really, uh, to a good chunk, Germany and Japan massacring unarmed civilians. And it was one of the few wars in history, major wars in history, uh, Hansen tells us, that um, the, the losers killed far more... Of, of, of the winning side than, than the reverse. And, and that's, again, a very interesting way to look at this war and this conflict. Uh, so I just really quickly want to talk about my kind of my engagement with Hansen and kind of my thoughts on Hansen, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the book. Um, <clears throat> so I had never heard of him before. Uh, in 2009, uh, before 2009, um, I got my master's degree in history in 2009. I began teaching uh, history at a college um, that fall, and I was kind of looking for, I was going to be teaching both United States history and Western civilization, subsequently world history as well, and I was looking for more, um, I was looking for, for books on kind of Western civilization to kind of build up my uh, my um, background there. I mean, I had done my master's degree primarily on kind of Hitler and Stalin and, and, and World War II on the Eastern Front, and I'd taken a lot of European classes, but there were still some areas I was a little fuzzy on, so I, I wanted to buy uh, a bunch of books on kind of just Western, the evolution of Western history, and hopefully kind of find ways to, to effectively teach it. And one of the books that I found that interested me, I went to Barnes & Noble, I remember this, and I, and I one day, and I bought a bunch of, bunch of books on the subject, and... I bought, I found uh, Hansen's Carnage and Culture, um, which kind of fascinated me because it, it, it was one of these books about Western culture and West, the evolution of Western culture, but it was also a military history, and that, of course, attracted me very much. So I went ahead and I got this, this book um, uh, and several others that day. Some of them were horrible. Um, and then some of them were quite good. Uh, but I sat on my shelf for a while. I didn't read it immediately. In fact, I read, before I read that, I read his um, Autumn of War and the, the other one, these other collection of essays about Iraq and Afghanistan, and I, and I really enjoyed them. I didn't agree with everything in, in them, but I, 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 I really enjoyed the way Hansen wrote and the arguments he presented and kind of this, 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 these ideas that he... Um, that he offered in, in these in these books that really quite appealed to me. Read several other of his books. I read Carnage and Culture, which I loved, which Carnage and Culture became kind of the the basis of how I taught a lot of my Western civilizations and world history classes and that idea of, uh, you know, fundamentally what, what defines civilizations or cultural values and how those values are applied um, matter. And, and really the, the idea too in Carnage and Culture that how a civilization, how a nation for that matter, makes war is very reflective of those societies and will tell you a lot about what exactly it is that that nation treasures, what it values, what it um, prizes, uh, and, and how it fights war. Because very often, uh, very often throughout war, it will, uh, you know, a nation may not do something that's militarily um, the, the right thing to do if it conflicts with. Um, other values they have, you know, for instance, 
a lot of civilizations had, uh, you know, horsemen. They liked their aristocrats to ride horses, and they kind of undervalued the utility of, of foot soldiers. So very often, a lot of societies would would not kind of make that transition to to being primarily a foot army when it, it so valued the status the, the the status within the society that riding horses brought. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Very interesting book. I read several other books by him, um, and a book that that he wrote that really really reminds me of this book here, the um, Second World Wars, was his book A War Like No Other, which was about the Peloponnesian War, because it takes that same kind of thematic and analytical approach to the Peloponnesian War that that he brings to World War II with with the uh, Second World Wars. So. Um, very good book on the Peloponnesian War that uh, if you're interested in that, I'd highly recommend that. <clears throat> so um, so I've, I've read a lot of books by Hansen. I, 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 like I say, I, I think he's, he's an absolutely fine historian. Um, I actually have consulted with him a few times about my own, uh, working on my own dissertation. Um, so I think, I think he's a first-rate um, historian. And I've, I've reviewed, I reviewed several of his books, in, or at least two or three of his books, in the Desert News. I think the Savior Generals, which was a great book, is novel. Um, uh, the name eludes me at the moment, but about uh, the um, the end of Sparta was the name of that one. He, um, I, I read that book as well, and reviewed that book as well in the Desert News. So uh, let's go ahead then and talk about the Second World Wars. Well, Second World Wars, like I say, it's it's divided into kind of these thematic ideas and these thematic approaches. Um, the there are kind of seven parts to this book that he um, that he incorporates. Kind of seven parts to the book that he um, kind of groups these these thematic ideas together, and they are um, ideas, air, water, earth, fire, people, and ends. And of course, you can imagine some of these things. Uh, you're fairly obvious, but I'll get into to, to a little bit more of these things here. Um, First of all, um, in ideas, he discusses kind of some of these general themes that I was just discussing uh, with you. Uh, and, and he wrote, uh, on uh, page 11, he wrote, Yet the Allies understood history far better in any existential war. Only the side that has the ability to destroy the homeland uh, of the enemy wins. Um, so the idea is Germany and Japan were incapable of knocking Britain and and the United States out of the war and the Soviet Union out of the war. Um, you know, you could argue they came close with the Soviets, but I mean, there was never, you know, a real attempt to cross the English Channel. There certainly was never any real possibility of, uh, logistical possibility of an invasion of the United States. The, the ally, the, the Axis power simply could not have knocked those nations out of the war. As we saw, the Allies were very capable of overrunning Germany and were entirely prepared, willing, and capable of overrunning Japan if they had not been defeated um, through through air power. Um, so that's kind of, again, one of these important themes of the book. Um, he actually goes on to write, Throughout history, conflict had always broken out between enemies when the appearance of deterrence, the material and spiritual likelihood of using greater military power successfully against an aggressive enemy, vanished. From Carthage to the Confederacy, weaker bellicose states could convince themselves of the impossible because their fantasies were not checked earlier by cold reality. A stronger appearance of power and of the willingness to employ it might have stopped more conflicts before they began. Put another way, deterrence in the famous formulation of the 17th century British statesman George Saville, first Marquess of Halifax, meant that men are not hanged for stealing horses, but that horses may not be stolen. That's from page 14. Uh, again, he's talking about this power of, of deterrence, and very often when we consider the ideas of, of cold, you know, of cold wars and arms races, uh, it's it's very much in a negative light. It's this idea: well, they just draw resources from other sectors of the economy, and they don't they only in, increase and enhance the risk of war. Um, you know, we're thinking, of course, here of the Peloponnesian War. Athens and Sparta were kind of competing militarily, um, you know, in, in the years prior to the Peloponnesian War, and that went badly, led to a, you know, 27-year conflict, roughly. And then, of course, the, the great example of um, the alliance blocks prior to World War One, where you had <coughs> the, uh, um, you had the uh, central powers and you had the allied powers, and they were um, central powers, and the, the, the triple allies and the triple entente, um, who would become those other powers? They 
uh, had an arms buildup. Germany, Austria, they were um, Italy prior to the war. They were building up weapons to use against the the uh, British, the French, and and the Russians. And you know, this the co- the conventional wisdom is this destabilized Europe. It made war more likely, and it you know to an extent probably did. Um, not necessarily just having arms, but there were a number of of reasons for that, and that certainly contributed to it. But the point Hansen's making here is that it it was it's a point that Niall Ferguson made in his book on World War One, The Pity of War, which was a very interesting book. Uh, and the point is that sometimes an arms race is a good thing. Um, if Britain and France had been willing to engage in an arms race sooner in the 1930s against against Germany, uh, it would have made Hitler perhaps a little more apprehensive about engaging in war. And it would have it would have shown that, that they had a little more little more um, bite behind their bark. Um, as it was, the British and the French were kind of content to um, they were kind of content to rely on the um, Kellogg Briand Pact, which of course is the 1927 28 uh, uh, Agreement that outlawed war. You know, supposedly there were going to be no more wars fought because of that agreement. They relied on on things like that to kind of justify their their inaction. And they said, "Well, you know, we've got diplomatic cover here. We got we got our everything in order." They weren't concerned as they should have been with the with the reality that I believe it was Bismarck said a treaty is only worth the paper it's printed on. And the fact of the matter was, you know, Hitler wanted war, was, was preparing for war, and they didn't want to even entertain. Um, you know, Baldwin, Chamberlain, they didn't even want to entertain the possibility that Hitler was w- could not be trusted. They didn't want to entertain the possibility that here was a man who wanted war, when so many people, certainly in Britain and France, and even in Germany for that matter, didn't. So, um, again, this idea of Engaging in an arms race um, is not always a bad thing. Is is a lesson he's giving here, and deterrence is is important. <clears throat> he goes on to write uh, on page seventeen. What followed was the central tragic irony of World War II. The weaker Axis powers proved incapable of defeating their allied enemies on the field of battle, but nevertheless were more adept at killing far more of them and their civilian populations. World War II was one of the few major wars in history in which the losing side killed far more soldiers than did the winners, and far more civilians died than soldiers. So again, that reiterates what I mentioned at the beginning. This is one of the central things of the book. The Axis powers were... um, I mean, were, were killers far and beyond any um, uh, military necessity. Uh, in fact, I'm reading right now, uh, I've got an advanced copy of uh, James Scott's Rampage, which is about the Battle of Manila in 1945. Boy, that, that just makes your skin crawl, What some of what the Japanese were doing to the Filipino um, civilians. It's, it's just absolutely mind-boggling and horrifying and, and apocalyptic what went on there. And again, this 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 plays into the um, this theme this this it, it, it illustrates this theme that for the Axis powers killing in and of itself what was a goal was 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 part of what they were doing you know the the, the Western allies certainly killed a number of people killed a lot of civilians um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute but 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 for the for the Axis powers it was it was an end in and of itself killing there. Uh, he goes on to write, 48, um, overreach after even the smallest victory was in the fascist DNA. <clears throat> overreach even after the smallest victory was in the fascist DNA. So, again, I take that to mean, I think I think in this context where he wrote it, he's talking about the, the, the Italians kind of spreading themselves too thin. You know, they were engaged in North Africa at the same time as they invade uh, Albania in, not Albania, but into uh uh, the Balkans from Albania in 19, May of 1941, which of course caused the Germans to come in and intervene when the Italians got slowed down. And this is very true of of you know both the Axis and the Allies overreach. You know the the Germans they they'd conquered much of of, of Europe 
and they believed because that was relatively easy, um, they could go ahead and they could conquer Russia, which was not going to be nearly as easy. And there were there was there was reason to think they might be able to do it. I mean, they had won against Russia in, in um, 1917, so there was a, and they didn't have Panzer divisions then. So there's there was reason to, to suspect they could do it. But it's this idea of you know we can do it, and we're gonna we're gonna keep gambling here. We're gonna keep 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 going for broke. And and that idea of overreach and the same thing with the Japanese you know they have no problem in the world taking on the the world's most powerful country the United States because they you know they kind of had that Americans are shopkeepers mentality so they didn't you know it wasn't a uh, it, it wasn't the consideration perhaps it should have been they didn't appreciate just what the United States could do when it was fully roused and that's again another another important thing and you can even look at this statement Overreach after even the smallest victories in the fascist DNA. You can even look at that in terms of in terms of the Holocaust and some of these other instances of civilian killing, where well, certainly with the Holocaust, this 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 German attitude that they could kill an entire people, that they could murder an entire race of people, an entire ethnicity of people. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling in the fact that they could do it. And, and even to take this further from a military standpoint, uh, we see this again. The Germans were always, they, they suffered from giganticism, right? Um, the Bismarck, the Tirpitz, these huge battleships, which had been commissioned bef before technically the uh, Third Reich came to power, but the fact that they completed them and they believed they could be war-winning weapons, when in fact they would have been so much better served with uh, buying you know a lot more U-boats um, and, and improved U-boats and, and these sorts of things would have been served much better in the Navy. Instead of building, um, you know, Tiger tanks and King Tiger tanks and Panther tanks, these heavy tanks, which were great tanks when they worked and when they were in numbers, but they never were. It would have been much more effective if they had built um, many smaller tanks, many more adequate tanks, like a ton of adequate tanks instead of a few really, really good tanks. And that's another point Hansen's going to make as well. Um, you can see their, the overreach in their buildings, right, in the architecture, and Albert Speer, and what he was planning for post-war Berlin. <clears throat> in part two uh, is air. So here in part two, he's talking about the air war in, um, in, in the war. Um, on page 101, he says, uh, he's talking, talking here about the um, kind of the, 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 the moral threshold of, of employing the atomic bombs uh, and strategic bombing in general. So he says... <clears throat> Deciphering the ethical st calculus of strategic bombing is almost impossible given the ongoing slaughter of nearly 27 million on the Eastern Front, the smokestacks of Auschwitz, the inability of the Allies to invade France until mid-1944, the need for a second front to placate Stalin, and the relative ineffectiveness prior to the summer of 1944 of seriously hurting the operation of the Third Reich in other Western theaters such as Italy. So he's saying, you know, within the context of the war, I mean, strategic bombing here is, of course, a horrible thing. Uh, you know, Kurt Vonnegut says, you know, regardless of how it was used, it was a massacre no matter how you look at it. And, and it was. I mean, the Allied strategic bombing campaign was, was horrible, catastrophic. Again, that word apocalyptic comes to mind, particularly when you think like the fire bombings of Dresden and, uh, and uh, Hamburg and, and particularly Tokyo in March of 45. These things were just brutal. Um, and yet, when you put it in context of this larger war, this ongoing war of um, just day-to-day -day killing and, and this slog, both in terms of kind of, you know, legitimate military operations and then this, this mass murder machine that was the Axis and Allied uh, uh, armies that killing civilians left and right, um, you know, the moral thresholds had... had, had had passed, they'd eased. You know, the Germans um, during the Blitz had, had employed um, this kind of area bombing um, to little effect, relatively little effect for them. But the Allies took it, improved upon it, ran with it, and again, the moral thresholds had had been abandoned. You know, I mean, long before the atomic bombs were dropped. But he goes on to say. <clears throat> on 117, a critical consequence of dropping two atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki may have. Uh, not just 
may, may have been not just precluding a costly American invasion of Japan, but also ending a nightmarish incineration of Japanese civilization. Now, what he's talking about here is the fact that, like I mentioned, that firebombing raid in March of 1945, Curtis LeMay, who was head of the strategic bombing operation against Japan, uh, he had planned to just completely level every Japanese city. And, um, you know, Hansen's saying, what, what would have been worse? Dropping the two atomic bombs, which is what happened, or having every single Japanese city laid to waste through, through these um, uh, fire bombings, which were so much more effective against Japanese structures and, and, and um, cities. Well, I mean, if we're doing devil's arithmetic here and we're simply looking for fewer lives lost, you know, each one of those firebombing raids, one can imagine, probably killed just about as many people as the atomic bombs did. Um, certainly, the Tokyo firebombing, I don't have the exact numbers here, but, but I mean, it was well within the ballpark of what happened with the atomic bombings. So here he's suggesting that. He's suggesting that the atomic bombs ultimately saved lives for that alone. I mean, completely discount the idea of an, uh, an invasion force, which of course would have seen tremendous loss of life, both for the Japanese and the American army. But here he's saying just by ending the strategic bombing plan campaign that was planned from Curtis LeMay alone, you know, dropping the, the atomic bombs was worth it. And Hansen's actually very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's very, uh, he recognizes the, the importance and the, the, necessity of what LeMay was doing, what he was planning. He he has a certain respect for Curtis LeMay. And, uh, you know, I think that's justified. I think Curtis LeMay often gets a bad rap because he's seen as just this, this butcher. But, you know, very often the best generals, you know, the ones that understand if we're going to win this war, it's going to be bloody. And I think, you know, LeMay understood that. And that's a deeply unsatisfying thing to say. But, but we needed to end the war and they weren't going to give up. And we had to stop him. So that's what, that was the idea of, of um, creating that, um, that plan for the strategic bombing. Uh, I think Curtis LeMay, in fact, said something to the effect, and I think this is in the book, where he said after the atomic bombs went off and Jap Japan surrendered, he said it was kind of anticlimactic. I mean, he was really expecting this big endgame battle that, that never happened. You know, if nothing else, a big endgame air campaign that never happened. And you know, thank God, right? <clears throat> In part three, of course, again, he deals with with navies. And he talks about the regional navy of both the Axis powers. The the Germans were able to kind of fill this vast U-boat fleet. The, the Japanese, of course, had their fleet carriers, and they were a much bigger, much stronger uh, navy. They were really a force to be reckoned with. But even then, they, couldn't, they could only project that power so far. Uh, he wrote, uh, Axis, uh, the Axis built large battleships and too few of the type of ships that would have helped them win German U-boats and Japanese fleet carriers. The British and American navies were, oh, you know what, actually, he didn't, he, this, uh, he didn't write this. This is just my notes here. Uh, but but he, he wrote that, again, the Japanese should have built um, the uh, more fleet carriers. That's where, instead of building like the big battleships like uh, the Yamamoto, um, the, the Germans, instead of the Tirpitz, the, the, the um, Bismarck, they should have invested more U-boats. They should have built more smaller but good weapons instead of large and theoretically great weapons, which, which obviously, you know, were, were, were not cost-effective in any way, shape, or form. Not for, not for what they were intended and not for what they produced. Um, the British and the American navies, they did manage to create, as I say, these, two, these legitimate two ocean navies. They could easily move men, relatively easily move men and material around the world in a way the Axis could not dream of. <coughs> <coughs> he cites this, of course, and certainly Britain and America, and particularly the United States, had um, resources that the Axis powers you know, didn't have access to, industrial base that they didn't have access to. But also, too, he says, you know, generally the naval policy, the training standards, um, the applied learning experience, all of these things were, were used better and more effectively by the Allies than they were during the Axis during World War II. Um, in part four, he talks about 
uh, it's Earth, right? And here he talks about a lot of just generally the armies on the ground, boots on the ground. He says, foot soldiers ultimately decided every theater in World War II except the final defeat of the Japanese homeland forces. That's on page 210. Um, and what he, what he refers to there is the fact that, um, you know, of course, Japan surrendered because of the atomic bombs, because of the air campaign. But um, the absolute centrality, the absolute necessity of infantry fighting in this war, it was, it, it, it really decided... Um, virtually every phase of this war, as he says, except for the surrender, surrender of uh, Japan at the end. He quotes Patton when Patton said, um, talked about how one thing that set Americans apart from, from the Axis was that Americans were mechanics. They understood how to repair vehicles, and this was essential for mechanized infantry. If you have infantry and trucks moving around, trucks break down, and we Americans had a had a uh, an aptitude and a love of machinery and mechanization in a way that a lot of the the soldiers from these other nations maybe necessarily didn't. I mean, certainly there were some and and, and perhaps many, but but not it wasn't as ingrained into the American psyche, uh, into the psyche, national psyche, as it was here with Americans. And that's the point Patton was making, and of course uh, Hanson quotes him there. Now. One thing he, he he mentions here is very interesting too, because this actually dealt a kind of kind of deals a little bit with my um, when I wrote my master's thesis. Um, my master's thesis was on kind of the Eastern Front, Hitler and Stalin, and kind of their generals, the relationships they had, the dictators had with their generals. But he writes here on two thirty two, by training in nature, few of even the best German generals were equipped to think of war in terms of grand strategy or geopolitics and were flummoxed by Hitler's often esoteric talk of critical strategic resources, contours, and and changing alliances, and cultural nonsense. His pseudo-historical ranting worked well on a professional Prussian military class often that so often uh, could not distinguish its disastrous uh, from its own mediocre strategic thinking, and whose legacy theretofore had been largely free, uh, had largely, had been... (laughs) had been largely a free wartime hand from its political overseer. Had largely had a free uh, wartime hand from its overseer. Sorry about that. So uh, the point he's making here is that the, the this was a point that uh, uh, John Moisier made in his book, I think it was called Cross of Iron. And Moisier was not a professional historian. He was, I think, like an English professor or something, but, he, but, he, but he's written several books on, on World War II history. that uh, he, Some of them are quite insightful. And, and here in, in uh, that particular book, he says, you know, the German army produced great captains. It did not produce great generals. It did not produce truly strategic thinkers. It produced... Um, um, officers that were looking to win the next battle or the next campaign, but they weren't thinking, how do we win the war? And and Hansen here says, you know, he kind of poo-poos Hitler's uh, strategic thinking. And I think, I think that's not entirely fair. And here I part a little bit with Hansen, just because um, when we think of Hitler, the general, we always think of him making these irrational orders, sending people needlessly to their death. And, you know, I think a lot of that didn't really occur until around Stalingrad and then for the rest of the war. I think early in the war, uh, Hitler did have a strategic vision. Um, you know, certainly no no uh, comment on, 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 you know, the, the man's moral values. That he was atrocious. He was a monster. It doesn't need to be said. But I think he had some, some strategic ability, even if it was that of a... Of a of an amateur, of a military amateur, and he was a military amateur, but I mean, he he was thinking, how do we win the war? And he was thinking about these things, and you know, <clears throat> Hitler backed the innovators. In, you know, prior to the war, he backed Kurt Student in the Airborne Corps. He he backed Guderian and the other tank leaders in, in developing um, what, you know, the Wilmungskrieg or, or Blitzkrieg, as we knew it in the West. Um, you know, and, and, and two, he, he backed uh, uh, von Manstein and Sicklecut. Sicklecut was the operational plan for the invasion of France. Uh, the other generals, uh, you know, uh, did not want, did not think it would be a good plan. They, 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 they wanted to, of course, continue just to do what they did in 1914, even after the plans had fallen into the hands of the Allies. And, and Hitler really was there. He said, no, 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 let's, let's go with von Manstein. And, of course, that was the plan that, that, that brought such success to the, uh, 
to the Germans there. So I think that is a uh, very good. Um, I mean, I, I think that illustrates um, maybe uh, uh, it's a good illustration of maybe where I'm. I, Hansen and I are, are maybe on a little bit different pages there. Now, certainly, uh, and and two, you know, one other thing, uh, we hear a lot about Hitler's stand fast orders. You know, you know, defend this land to the end, defend it to the end, and that was true. Um, that that was disastrous again post Stalingrad, and, and when Germany was shrinking, and it, it, they should have been having more strategic retreats. But in 1941, when, when the Germans invade Russia, and they get right to the gates of Moscow, and then in uh, November, December, we have the, the Soviet counterattack, um, Hitler issued one of those hold firm orders, and that was essential. If the German army had started to retreat, just as the Soviets were counterattacking then, I think you probably would have seen a disintegration and a rout of the German army. Uh, in Russia that would have sent it back hundreds of miles and would have destroyed, you know, tons of equipment, captured and killed many German soldiers. So I think Hitler's decision for the standfast order in, at the end of 1941 against Moscow was was the right call for his army. Um, and of course, that, that standfast order really, I mean, that was kind of ingrained in Hitler as a World War I corporal, right? That's what you did in World War I. You would take ground and you would hold it and you would defend it. And that's something that um, kind of kind of illustrates his thinking there a little bit. Now, again, to be clear, after Stalingrad, when it was obvious, I think even at that point to Hitler, that he was not going to have, he couldn't win the war in a conventional military sense. He was increasingly fighting the war to split the Allies. He believed that at some point the unnatural alliance between the capitalist West and the communist Soviets would split and then he would be in the middle and he would kind of have to negotiate between them. And I think that delusion sustained him for the rest of the war. What he failed to understand was that Hitler himself was the thing that was uniting these people. Their mutual hatred of him is what kept them together. Um, but again, he's, he's, Hansen's generally correct here that the, the, the German generals were not strategic thinkers. You know, again, Hitler was constantly going on about the need to protect the Crimea because it was an unsinkable aircraft carrier that could be used to uh, as a base to bomb the Pelushti oil fields, and that's why he didn't want to abandon Crimea, and of course they had to abandon it. But he didn't want to abandon it, and that was a major reason. Um, you know, in, in Guderian's memoirs, there's a, there's a very telling anecdote where uh, During the invasion of France, where where Guderian's sitting down with Hitler and uh, with field headquarters, and he's saying, you know, okay, we're gonna we're gonna advance here, we're gonna advance here, we're gonna advance here, and then we think we can get to here, and then Hitler turns around and says to him, well, okay, and then what? You know, I mean, he, he Guderian was was and Guderian is aware of this, and he writes this in his in his memoirs. Guderian was only thinking in terms of the next kind of operational objective. And Hitler was thinking, how do we knock France out of the war? So again, very telling there. <clears throat> he goes on and he talks, of course, about uh, the Allies and some of the issues the Allied generals had in the war. Um, on page 283, he says, uh, Bradley and British generals deprecated George Patton's use of small amphibious operations to outflank German resistance, when they should have encouraged more of them and on a greater scale. General Montgomery, as well as Omar Bradley, had shown a peculiar habit of winning campaigns while letting a defeated enemy flee to regroup after El Alamein, here in Sicily, and soon at the Falaise Pocket in Normandy. Any time Hitler did not insist on a trapped army standing fast to the last man dead or captured, German armies had an uncanny ability to escape sure encirclements. So again, this, this idea that... Um, you know, a lot of the Allied generals were, you know, you don't want to say overly cautious. And, and I do have a certain amount of sympathy for Montgomery at Falaise because, I mean, he was told at Falaise, you've got no more infantry coming. You know, we might be able to replace some artillery and tank, tank units here and there, but you've got no more infantry. You have to be careful there. And that's why Can took a month to take, even though it was the first day objective on D-Day, it took him a month to take it because he knew he didn't have any more infantry coming. He had to to be very judicious with them. But that said, um, Filet's pocket in, uh, in August of 44 was one of the greatest disasters of World War II, in my opinion. And I may deal with that a little bit in my dissertation. Um, but it's, it's a, there's no way that or the, the German army uh, should have escaped 
uh, from the uh, uh, should have escaped encirclement at that point. Um, Bradley, I think, was was almost criminally negligent in his order to hold back Patton. And yeah, I've heard all the arguments. They don't hold water. Anyway. <clears throat> Part five. Part five um, is uh, fire. And uh, here primarily he's talking about um, tanks and artillery and, and their uses. Uh, 364, he writes... Hitler reportedly understood the Wehrmacht's dilemma. He supposedly remarked to General Heinz Guderian at Army Group Headquarters on August 4th, 1941, If I had known that the figures for Russian tank strength which, gave, which you gave in your book were in fact the true ones, I would not, I believe, have ever started this war. It was a stunning admission that the single issue of tanks had altered the entire course of World War II. Um, again, the, uh, Hitler completely <laughs> mis underestimated, thank you, he underestimated the Soviet capacity for um, to sustain itself in that war, despite the crushing losses the Wehrmacht inflicted upon it at, at the beginning of the war. Very, uh, you know, and, and here he's saying, uh, <laughs> you know, he told Guderian, I didn't believe when you told me that they could they could replace those tank losses and I wouldn't have started the war if I had believed it. Um, that's interesting. You know, I wonder how, how honest Hitler was being when he when he said that to Guderian. Um, it's hard to believe Hitler letting something like abstract numbers like tank production stop him uh, from starting. Well, he, I mean, he had the numbers in front of him and he chose to ignore them. You know, it, because it didn't fit into his worldview, and I guess that's really the lesson. That's really the takeaway from that is is you know Hitler had this wonderful ability to ignore facts that conflicted with uh, what he wanted, and this is I think a good a good case of that. You know, he should have taken those numbers seriously, and he chose not to. Um, <clears throat> he goes on to write three sixty seven. Germany was faced with an enemy alliance that was capable of producing nearly a quarter million tanks in American, British, and Russian factories, five times the eventual total German output. Russia was able to move much of its entire tank industry eastward. The Third Reich was never fully able to exploit operating tank factories in France and Czechoslovakia and occupied Europe to maximize German output. Um, again, just... Uh, you, you, can, you can see here... Uh, this is, of course, the material schlott view of the war, right? The, the Allies were just simply able to produce more stuff. And I think, I think oftentimes we, we tend to look and, and f kind of say that was why we won World War II. And that was part of it. But I think there are a lot of other factors that sometimes we forget, just like generalship. There was, in um, Richard Overy's book, um, Why the Allies Won, I mean, he makes a great case for how, <clears throat> you know, American industrial capacity doesn't really kick in until you know late 43 so for most you know nearly two years a year and a half two years that was not the really a fundamentally a factor and it was really superior generalship from the allies and uh, and other factors that, that came into play there not simply um, the material the united states was producing um he goes on to say, uh, 375-77, The United States prevailed in Europe because of ubiquitous and reliable Shermans that more often fought Axis infantry rather than enemy armored units. And when they met superior German tanks, Shermans could often rely on close air and artillery support. Shermans proved superior to all Japanese tank models and provided invaluable support in major landings from Tarawa to Okinawa. So again, Shermans were not the best tanks in the war. That is to say, they, they, they didn't have the biggest guns, they didn't have the best armor, but there were a lot of them. And they were, you know, death by a million cuts, I guess, for the Germans here. But the Shermans, they were just a workhorse in that, in that war, and they did what needed to be due. Um, I think it was Stalin said, uh, quantity is its own quality. I guess you could, you could say that for the Sherman there. In part six, um, where he talks about people and the figures that ran the war, uh, he says on page 446, Another area where the Americans outshone all other land forces was their astonishing number of brilliant division, corps, and army commanders deployed in Europe, mostly one-, two-, and three-star generals who were more talented than their four-star generals, such as Bradley, Clark, and Hodges, who commanded them. 
There were no finer division commanders than Terry De La Mesa Allen, J. Lawton Collins, Manton S. Eddy, Leonard T. Giroux, Wade Hayslip, uh, Troy Middleton, Matthew Ridgway, Lucian Truscott, and Wal uh, Walton Walker. The general excellence of the Army's infantry and armor commanders was, due, was partly due to the combat experience of many in World War I, partly to the excellent combat... Uh, partly to the excellent system of war colleges and continuing tactical and strategic education, especially at the Command and General Staff School at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, during the 1930s, and partly to, steer, and, and partly to the sheer winnowing out process of the Depression-era army that created motivation and competition for scarce resources and rare promotions. So this, this um, American generalship is, is what I'm going to be working on here on my dissertation, so I, I really like that and appreciate that. And, I am consistently impressed with a lot of these generals he's made. Uh, he's talking about you know, Terry Allen and, 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 uh, and these others. Uh, very, very good and capable guys. And as he says, you know, Bradley, like I say, dropped the ball, the ball at Fillet's pocket. Both Bradley and Hodges really dropped the ball at, uh, at uh, uh, the Hurtgen Forest. Got a lot of people killed, uh, perhaps unnecessarily. Um, there's other figures too. I mean, Lloyd Frendendall commanded a corps in North Africa, and that guy was, you know, just oh man. Maybe I'll have to do another video on Frendendall sometime. But he just just a piece of work. So um, American General Shapiro, he's saying these guys were all just really, really good guys. You know, um, George Marshall. Um, he, he, the theory was the, the army legend was he had a little black book and throughout his career he was going around making these little notes about everybody who um, he liked and thought maybe at some point would be useful in a war and this was never proven it's a rumor as I say but supposedly when he became our chief of staff in September of uh, 39 he started putting these people in positions where they would fight the next war and um, he kind of put the guys that were running armies that were in positions of power uh, at that time, people that outranked him in, in theory, um, uh, you know, or had a post rank that was higher than his, he fired them. He got rid of these guys. He just cleaned house with these guys. He didn't want these these older generals around, which is odd because, again, Frendendall was like 59, which is kind of the age of these people he's clearing out, but he kept Frendendall. Um, <clears throat> but he gets, but he brings in a lot of these these younger guys, like Eisenhower, like like Patton, you know. And uh, a lot of these guys are going to have some very important roles to play in, in World War II. And, and even some of these guys I'm not wild about, like, uh, like uh, Bradley. Um, now, you know, you want to contrast this, too, with, with the German generals. Now, some of the German generals were, were very good. Von Manstein was arguably the best general, German general of, of World War II, in my opinion. Um, uh, Rommel was, was no slouch. Um, you know, Guderian certainly did some good things, um, you know, did some uh, military competent things, I should say. Uh, and, and there's a whole, whole bunch of others I, 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 could, I could name that were, that were, you know, good operational generals in that sense. But again, I say they oftentimes lack that, that strategic sense. And, and critically, too, they, they, virtually all of the German generals were morally compromised in some way. And either they were morally compromised in the sense that they were... <clears throat> You know, like von Manstein, again, who I say is probably the best German general in terms of operational operations in the war. You know, he was loaning out his units to SS death squads in Russia. And, you know, he, he said at Nuremberg, you know, I was trying to, I was arguing with the SS. I was constantly arguing with these guys and made it sound like he was arguing that with them on these kind of moral grounds of you shouldn't be killing these people. And in fact, he was simply arguing with them about, hey, I want my guys back. I got an operation. I need my guys back. So, I mean, he was entirely complicit in that. But even beyond that, a lot of these generals frequently accepted bribes from Hitler. Um, that was one of the ways, you know, I mean, Hitler knew he needed, he needed the military on his side. I mean, he, he, there was this constant tension between he and the military, and he needed the military on his side. So he, um, and I mean, indeed, it was the, the focal point of the resistance, ultimately, to Hitler in World War II was the German army with the July 20th, 1944 um, coup, attempted coup. But uh, frequently, Hitler would make cash gifts to his generals. Um, Walter von Brastisch, who was the uh, uh, CNC of the army uh, prior to December 1941, when, when Hitler fired him and made himself the CNC of the army, 
Uh, von Brechtisch, uh, he <laughs> wanted a divorce, and I think Hitler essentially paid for his divorce, gave him the money so he could get divorced. Um, Hitler had a kind of a special account that he would use to, to, to pay off generals. Um, very often, too, he would let the generals um, pick out chateaus, castles, um, palaces, large houses in Poland and other conquered territories that he would then grant them, like a like a king granting a feudal estate to somebody. So these, so again, the, the German generalship, they were, like I say, morally compromised. Certainly in a way that I I can't think of any any American general or, or British general um, that was morally compromised in that way. You know, the Soviets are a little trickier. I mean, that was such a weird system and such a bloody system in and of itself. Um, but there's a lot of similarities between the Soviet system and, and, and the Soviet army's relationship to Stalin with the, with the German relationship to uh, to um, Hitler. And I'm not going to go into that right now. But uh, And suffice it to say that the, the Japanese uh, leadership, Japanese military leadership, their generals were completely morally corrupt. Like I say, I'm reading that book Rampage right now. I've read several other books on the subject. And you read, read Iris Chang's uh, The Rape of Nanjing. I mean, my gosh, just the blood and the suffering and the murder and the massacres and the rape and the misery the Japanese army caused um, wherever it went in that war. You know, they, they conquered virtually you know, all these great spaces in Asia saying we are here as, as liberators, we're here to get rid of the colonial, the, the European colonial powers and we're here to create a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere for all of us. And then they start using, you know, Taiwanese uh, people for bayonet practice, you know. Um, they they conduct mass rapes wherever they go in in response to the um, the uh, uh, Doolittle raids in 1942. The Japanese uh, used chemical weapons and murdered you know over a million Chinese civilians in in China as you know as, as retaliation. I, and the Germans, of course, you know, Germans weren't much better. They weren't better. <laughs> So just just like I say, the, the, it's hard to make a case that the access the access generals. You can talk about them about military eff efficacy, but but they're all tremendously morally compromised in a way that the Allied generals simply weren't. Again, you, you might be able to to say in some ways the Soviet generals were, but but still, I have a hard time even thinking for a moment to the extent that the that the Germans and the Japanese um, their generals were. That's again something else for another day. Uh, he goes on in, in part six. He also spends a lot of time talking about um, the workers and the in people that worked in industry and how and how industry worked with these, um, how the people worked in industry to support their nations. Uh, he has a wonderful chapter called "The Dead," where essentially he just talks about casualties, how people died. It was very good. I, I really enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, and in part seven ends, he essentially wraps it up. He kind of gives us summations where he, where he kind of tells you what he what he thinks and what his what his ideas here are and he has a wonderful quote on on 513 he says simply the allies learned to fight like the axis the axis never learned to produce like the allies you know i love that line because there's there's a lot of truth in that line there's a lot of insight in that line the allies learned to fight like the axis the axis never learned to produce like the allies um ultimately the allies became the superior military forces throughout the world. Um, they became more effective military forces, and they were able to win the war. Uh, and the and the and the Axis powers for you know the Axis powers pretty much sucker punched everybody, right? I mean that's that's what they did. I mean they sucker punched Poland. England and France come into the war then, but they're not prepared. They're not prepared for war, and that's their own damn fault. They weren't prepared for the war. I mean, Japan sneak attacks everybody. They sucker punch and they make great gains right off the bat, but they can't sustain them. Um, and and that's that's really the lesson of World War II. You know, bullies get the first punch in. They can cause a lot of problems, but you know, if you're strong, if you're strong and you're determined, you can you can make up for it. And I don't mean to simplify everything like that, but but I mean essentially that's what we're learning here. So anyway, in short, that's kind of just a basic overview of of this book. I have read probably in my life hundreds, if not thousands, of books that dealt with World War II in one subject or another, in one way or another. 
And I have to tell you, this, this may be the best single volume I've ever read from an analytical standpoint on World War II. It's just absolutely fascinating. And it's, and it's you know, Hansen, like I say, I'm a very big fan of Hansen. My, kind of my, my, my feeling about a, uh, whenever I read a book is if the book has within it some great takeaway, if it has some great... Um, if it has something, you know, something, whether it's an idea, whether it's a, a, a you know, a concept of looking at a, at a person or a, or a nation or, or warfare itself or, or, or what have you, if a, if a nonfiction book can, can, can really give you something to take away, it's a good book. Now, it's really exceptional books. Every chapter, they can do that. Every chapter, you've got to take away and you're like, wow, that is amazing. That is amazing. I am not I'm not exaggerating when I say with this book and with a lot of Hansen's books, but this book in particular, um, just about every page, I'm taking away something that's blowing me away that I'm thinking this is a fantastic, fantastic book. So anyway, I just want to share my thoughts on uh, Victor Davis Hansen's The Second World Wars, how the first global conflict was fought and won, and uh, maybe I will do some more of these in the future. Thanks. Bye-bye.